Hey everyone, Ralph here again. Uh, so last week I published a video on the supposed room temperature superconductor, LK99. The timing of the video was pretty interesting because basically right after I made that video, there were a billion studies published that seemed to replicate at least a few of the results from that initial study. Today I want to talk about the study that I found most interesting, um, a simulation paper by Sinead M. Griffin at the Berkeley National Labs in California. Uh, this paper titled The Origin of Correlated Isolated Flat Bands in Copper Substituted Lead Phosphate Appetite. Uh, before I get into this paper though, I do want to make a quick remark about something that I've seen discussed a lot uh, online. Before I get into this paper, I do want to quickly talk about magnetic levitation briefly. Um, so I mentioned in my previous video that superconductors levitate over external magnetic fields. Uh, they express what's called the Meissner effect, which means that they perfectly exclude and repel external magnetic fields, which basically just means that they end up floating above some sort of external magnetic field. Now, magnetic levitation is not a property that is unique to superconductors. Um, magnetic levitation can also come as a result of something called diamagnetism, uh, which is basically how materials seem to want to repel and expel and turn against external magnetic fields. Uh, depending on how diamagnetic a material is and how strong a magnetic field is, uh, that means things can just float above some sort of external magnetic fields. Uh, diamagnetism is actually incredibly common. It's in literally everything. Uh, even you and I are <laughs> diamagnetic to some extent. Um, if you Google like diamagnetic frogs, uh, I'm not going to show this in this video. Feel free to look it up yourself. Um, but people have just made frogs float in sufficiently strong external magnetic fields. Uh, diamagnetism is in everything. Some materials are more diamagnetic than others, which means they can levitate at lower external magnetic fields. But this does basically mean that uh, magnetic levitation is not proof of superconductivity. The proof of superconductivity is zero resistance below some Curie temperature, uh, which has not been adequately uh, shown to date. It may be shown to date, uh, eventually, but it is not yet shown. But yeah, so what did I find most interesting then? Uh, that is this theory paper by Sinead Griffin. Basically, this paper is a DFT measurement which seemed to show this plot over here, which caused a lot of interest online. Um, but what is this showing? What is DFT? Uh, that's what we're going to today. So what is DFT? DFT is basically a simulation model, a simulation technique that tries to see how electrons work in some space. A simulator in general is just something that uses like rules of physics takes all the rules of physics that we know and are relevant to some system, um, puts them all in some sort of like playground, some sort of sandbox, which lets us like change and move things and see how what we do is affected by the rules of physics that we employ within the system. Um, I think that the most pop culture relevant example of a physics simulator is honestly something like uh, the recent Zelda games, if you've ever played those. Basically, in fact, a lot of modern video games, they express things like gravity or momentum or air resistance or stuff like that. This is, in some sense, a very basic physics simulator, a very basic physics engine that takes into account like real physics to some extent, lets us play around and move things around in this 3D space and see how real physics affects these digital objects. That's basically what a simulator is. If you've ever played any of those games though, you know that those things are one, super glitchy, sometimes, and two, don't model everything. Um, you know, so in Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, you can't like squish things and see how like squishy different things are. Um, you can't bend or like stretch things or whatever else. So uh, simulators are only relevant to the physics that are actually inside the system itself. Uh, we can go lower, uh, we can create speak simulators that take into account more or refine physics. Uh, if you want to go like down a layer, you can, for example, look at finite element modeling, which is what a lot of uh, engineers use when they're like designing buildings or whatever else. So you can take instead of objects themselves, split objects into little tiny blocks and see what each block does under particular forces or how different blocks stretch to create an entire, to change how an entire object stretches or squeezes. Basically, different models are used for different things, 
are relevant for different levels of physics and have different issues um, and problems with them. Now, if you go down like a billion layers from finite element modeling, you eventually get to DFT or density functional theory. And what DFT does is it models how electrons move through some sort of material, crystal material lattice. Uh, so some sort of material that's defined by elements uh, in some sort of known structure, we see how electrons move within them. So that's what's done in this paper. Basically this paper uh, takes a material structure which they interpret by looking at the x-ray diffraction data shown in the initial paper. Basically what the previous paper said is that this material has a hexagonal structure. Basically we have these hexagons that are just like layered on top and on top of one another and sort of tessellate like through some particular layer. And that is what we sort of see here in the simulation. Basically uh, if you take this black dot in the center which represents a hydrogen, it's surrounded by six of these purple circles which represent this lead to what they call it. Um, around you can see, for example, these six more uh, pink circles that represent the lead one. And the structure repeats and repeats and repeats. Basically, instead of taking this black dot as the center, you can take this black dot as the center. And this black dot will be surrounded by six of those purples. Uh, so we only have three here. The other three are just cut off by the diagram. And you have three more of the lead one, uh, the pink. And you'd have three more over here, but they're also cut off. So this is just one layer of this structure. It's going to be stacked on top of itself in like rows on top of one another. Now, from this structure, Sinead basically tries to see what the electrons are going to do through the structure itself. And that is all that is shown in this diagram. And this is sort of the main result of this paper. This is what DFT does. It tries to predict how electrons move through the predefined crystal lattice. Um, but how do we read this? Uh, basically, on the top level, we have a measurement of the energy of electrons relative to this zero level. Uh, this zero level is basically where the electrons are if nothing moves. Okay, if the material is like perfectly still and nothing moves, uh, which happens when it's like super, super cold, the electrons are going to lie at or below this dotted line, which is mostly behind this orange thing. So this means that it can go above it with higher energy, or it can be below it. It can have like less energy than it should be at that specific unique level. On the x-axis, we have a bunch of these weird letters. Now, what do these weird letters represent? Um, basically, these represent what's called the Brillouin zone of the crystal structure. Uh, this is a Wikipedia page. You can just Google a Brillouin zone. But basically, each of these letters represents a wave vector through the crystal structure um, and checks how the electrons move moving along that path. So from this point, we have what we call the gamma. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move from the gamma to the M to the K back to the gamma. So we have this triangular path that we want to see what the electrons are going to do as you move along that path. So we're going to move from gamma to M to K back to gamma. We're going to move up to A. Then we're going to move around L to H back to A. And that's what we see in the uh, simulation paper. Basically, we're following the possible energies of electrons as we move through that predefined path. From gamma, which is at the center, to M, which was, where is it? Which was at the sort of edge, the face of the hexagon, to K, which is at the corner, back up again. And that's what, again, what we see over here. We're tracking the possible energy of electrons as we move through points in the crystal lattice. Uh, at this line, we get this dash, which basically means we're breaking uh, to look at a different section. So we're instead of going from like line to line, we're doing a different line. So uh, we're looking at L to M instead, this vertical line, and then looking at K to H instead, because we've already looked at every other possible line. Basically, um, by looking at this particular path, we can see every possible line that electrons can move through in that crystal structure. Basically, this lets us see every possible state, every possible energy that an electron can have as it moves through the crystal structure. That is what this diagram is telling us. This is what DFT gives us. Uh, to the right, what Sinead does is she just zooms in. Um, so she zooms in around this region from uh, negative 0.4 to 0.1. That's what we have over here. 
Now, what does this tell us about superconductivity or what does this tell us about the material itself? Well, this shows us one thing that's interesting, um, and that is that around this zero level, we have a few possible states for electrons, which are again shown by this line. You can see this curvy line. Uh, so that means electrons can have energies that range from about, what's this, negative 0.5 to around like 0.8 or so. There is this band of energies that electrons can have that are near the zero level. That is interesting and possibly unique and shows that something weird is indeed going on in the material or can go on in the material. This, however, is not necessarily proof of superconductivity. Um, what I mean by that, okay, so we I have pulled up next to us a few other um, similar materials and their band structures. So this is the branch. The, this is a band structure of a similar apatite material. Uh, this is, I believe, a strontium apatite. And this is the band structure we have here. So this thing is also hexagonal, which means the parts we follow are exactly the same. Gamma to M to K to gamma to A to L to H, back to A, then L to M, then a K to H. And as you can see, this guy does not have a thin band around that zero level. There is a very broad band at and below the zero level. Uh, this is a very distinct band structure, very distinct possible electron energies from the previous material, the one that is supposedly superconducting. What does an actual superconducting band structure though look like? So this is uh, another real superconductor, uh, magnesium, magnesium diboride. Uh, so magnesium diboride is a superconducting material. Uh, that was found in 2001. This is a theory paper from around the same time. And in the top left, uh, so what we have now zoomed in on the screen, is the band structure of a superconducting material. And as you can see, this is basically completely different to what has been shown and calculated for the LK99 supposed room temperature superconductor. Uh, this thing is superconducting without this flat band around zero. Um, in fact, indeed, it is very difficult um, to show a material is superconducting from this typical DFT measurement. Uh, for comparison, this is the band structure for um, calcium diboride, which is a non-superconducting material. Uh, so superconducting, non-superconducting. Two different band structures. There isn't anything that you can like immediately tell. There is nothing about... Uh, flat banding and whatever else that is a pre prerequisite for superconductivity conventionally. It's possible it is, you know, a new type of superconductivity, but there is no present evidence for that. Uh, just for completion, to the right are different borides. So this is, I believe, magnesium hexaboride and calcium hexaboride. Neither of these are superconducting. This guy is. These three are not. Um, you cannot tell superconducting from a DFT measurement. But what does this paper tell us then? What's so interesting about it? Basically, this flat banding is a sign of something weird. Um, I, off the top of my head, can't think of any material that does express this flat band at around zero. Um, it's possible there are none. Um, it's also possible that I just don't know the band structures of every known material. Um, but... Yes. Um, to actually prove something is superconducting via simulations, uh, you need other types of modeling. DFT looks at particular electrons. Uh, superconductivity is correlated electrons, which is not necessarily covered by typical DFT measurements. Uh, you might do other uh, more quantum measurements, since like quantum Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo people might call it or people might use. However, again, that doesn't mean this material isn't interesting, which just means that this paper is not proof of superconductivity. It's proof that there's something possibly weird going on, but not necessarily superconductivity. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. I just mostly wanted to go through this particular paper. Uh, talk about what it actually said. Uh, it doesn't say the material is superconductivity. It says it shows interesting physics 
that may suggest Supercolor King, but is not. And I think that sort of got lost in the media discussions over time. So yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again so much for watching. Um, if you liked this video or the last video, please like and subscribe. Um, I do weird stuff on this YouTube channel, like sometimes like this, like pure science, pure physics. I do a lot of video game stuff. I do a lot of like video game science stuff as well. Uh, my next video is going to be on ELO systems. Uh, if you want to check that out, that should hopefully be out by next week. So yeah, uh, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye.